Hello, humans. Do you want to see proof that Christianity causes harm in the world? Yeah, well, you're not going to. Sorry. <laughs> An arrogant, angry atheist aggressively attacked me on Instagram and made a bold claim. Well, you know, because atheists spend their limited time here on this earth arguing against what they don't even believe exists, he made the claim, Christianity causes harm. Harm. Yeah, he then went on to say, if evangelicals weren't hell-bent on forcing their religion on others, we probably wouldn't give your God a second thought. And so, I responded to him, and I said, Bold claim. Now own your burden of proof. What harm does Christianity cause? And by whose standard of good do you judge Christians in order to know the harm? He responded by saying, Stripping women of bodily autonomy, ostracizing LGBTQ plus peoples that lead to torn families and higher suicide rates, the SBC and Catholic Church's history of protecting rapists that serve in their clergy, endorsing child abuse, denial of science. I could go on. I claimed Christianity causes harm to explain why we atheists will not stop calling out Christianity. I did not bring what is good into the conversation you did in an obvious attempt at a red herring. Hmm. Now, I briefly responded to his fallacious arguments, but then Instagram later informed me that my comment was going to be hidden and censored because it might hurt somebody's feelings. <laughs> you hurt my feelings. If those facts offend people, so be it. I can live with that. Facts don't care about your feelings. Thanks so much. Imagine my shock. Big tech censoring Christians. Whoever would have guessed that they would do such a thing? Anyway, I'm going to thoroughly refute everything this atheist said, show why atheism fails, and reveal why it's actually atheism that causes harm, not Christianity. So first, I'm going to present all of the atheist's arguments, and then I'm going to dismantle them one by one. So here's all of the atheist's arguments. Christianity causes harm. Well, the standard of good is nothing more than a red herring. Christians ostracize the LGBTQ community which leads to torn families and higher suicide rates. The SBC and Catholics protect rapists and endorse child abuse. Christians are science deniers and they strip women of bodily autonomy. Evangelicals force their beliefs on others. Okay, so in regards to the atheist claim that Christianity causes harm, I asked him, by whose standard of good do you judge Christians in order to know the harm? Well, in response, the atheist made another unsupported claim that the topic of good is a red herring. But is that true? No. A red herring is a fallacy in which an irrelevant topic is presented in order to divert attention from the original issue. But the necessity of good being defined is neither irrelevant nor diversionary because his argument for Christians causing harm appeals to that which is bad or wrong. And by appealing to wrong bad, he appeals to the absolute moral standard of good right. Therefore, if he cannot provide the standard of good right by which all bad wrong can be known, then how can he claim that Christianity causes harm which is bad wrong? No, the truth is that the atheist steals from God's absolute moral standard while attempting to justify his own wrong, which I will showcase. So, the atheist claims that Christians ostracize the LGBTQ community. Now again, this is the importance of why we must first define our terms. What does the word ostracize mean? Well, it means to exclude or reject someone from a society or group. But is exclusion in and of itself inherently evil? Again, the atheist appeals to what is bad wrong and thereby appeals to God's absolute moral standard of good right. Yet, the atheist is blind that he is condoning and enabling what is evil. And what is evil? Well, it's a privation of what is good. Now, excluding or rejecting a thing or person from a particular group is not bad or wrong or even hateful. Truth, by its very nature, has a narrow and exclusive feature to it. Consider a few examples here. So, a circle cannot be a square. Look, I'm sorry, but if you're a circle, you can't be a square. Here's another one. 
There are no married bachelors. Look, I'm sorry, but if you're a bachelor, you can't be in the married group. Here's another one. There are no female males. Look, I'm sorry, but if you're a male, you're not a female. Okay, so what category is the LGBTQ community excluded from? Well, by definition alone, they have excluded themselves from heterosexuality. And because we know by biology, anthropology, and God's word that the right and natural intended design is heterosexuality, all homosexuals would be excluded from the right and natural intended design. However, as I already said, Christians are not guilty of excluding them because they chose to exclude themselves. Now, in stark contrast to what this atheist claims, Christians say that the entire LGBTQ community is welcome to come back into alignment with the right and natural intended design. Therefore, Christians are being inclusive, not exclusive. However, because truth is what truth is and truth is exclusive, those who are not in alignment with truth will be excluded as a natural consequence of their choices. Now, what other category is the LGBTQ community excluded from? Marriage. Yeah, but why is that? Well, because there's only one true definition of marriage. Marriage is defined as a covenant between one male and one female, both being of a proper age of maturity that would enable a mutual consent to a lifelong partnership that is designed to unite the two as one in a committed relationship. The union of the two as one should not be detached, divided, disconnected, or divorced unless death separates them or the sin of sexual immorality defiles the covenant and creates a chasm between the commitment that would cause division. The definition of marriage does not discriminate against anyone or anything found beyond the boundaries of the definition. A distinction does not mean that there's an unfair discrimination. Exclusion does not equate to discrimination. Truth is absolute and narrowly defined. Right is right, wrong is wrong. I'm sorry. And so if anyone condones and enables the lies that are excluded from truth, well, that person is not in alignment and thus stands in opposition to true marriage and true families. Anyone who chooses to go beyond the boundary of the defined marriage, that person excludes him or herself from marriage. Therefore, the LGBTQ community excludes themselves from heterosexuality and marriage by their own free will. That's on them, not Christians. Now, Christians only invite people into the right design. In contrast, those who choose to do evil exclude themselves because they love their sins more than they love God, more than they love doing what is right. Now. The atheist claims that families are torn apart due to Christianity. Well, however, Christians teach the Word of God, and the Word of God teaches how to keep families together. Again, the LGBTQ community exclude themselves from marriage. Hence, they exclude themselves from being families. Parents consist of one father and one mother. Now, for a detailed explanation, see my article, Defending Marriage, that I published. It is extremely detailed and goes through all of that for you. Further, listen, the Bible teaches that divorce is wrong and families should not break apart and fall away from each other due to hardened hearts. <laughs> Jesus himself said this. And if the male female is in marriage and following the word of God, well, then they would love each other as described in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come back together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Mmm. 
Ah, yes, self-control. Well, in fact, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit. Christians live lives of self-control, and that actually benefits families. It is also for this reason that the Word of God tells us to imitate Christ and do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That also creates a healthy marriage and helps benefits families staying together. Therefore, the LGBTQ community exclude themselves from marriage and family life, whereas Christianity teaches how to love each other and keep families together. Christianity does not tear families apart. Rather, those who choose to live contrary to God's word tear families apart. Next, so the atheist claims that Christianity causes higher suicide rates. However, the Bible clearly preaches against suicide. Again, Christianity is not the cause of people committing suicide. Rather, people with unstable minds commit suicide because they do not have a transformed mind according to the will of God, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. The high suicide rate of the LGBTQ community is due to them being out of alignment with what is right and healthy. They have excluded themselves from the perfect will of God and thus opened themselves up to a natural consequence of a depraved mind that is susceptible to demonic attacks. Next, the atheist claims that the Southern Baptist Convention and the Catholic Church have all protected rapists and endorsed child abuse. Now, is there some truth to this? Yes. Throughout history, churches have been infiltrated with demons in disguise and wicked people have committed evil acts while wearing a religious facade. And you know what? Jesus condemned such people. Just read the entire uh, 23rd chapter of Matthew. However, in sharing this unfortunate truth about some evil people, the atheist actually commits at least three fallacious arguments, non sequitur, straw man, and the fallacy of composition. Now this is a non sequitur because the conclusion of Christianity causes harm simply doesn't follow. What evil people do in the name of God does not mean that God commanded them to do it. The sins of those particular perverts have no bearing on God who commanded them not to sin. In fact, Genesis chapter 34 depicts rape as a gross violation of God's design for the treatment of the human body. In Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 29, God commands the rapist to be stoned to death because evil should be purged from the community. And the New Testament also condemns rape because it is sexual immorality. And regarding people who violate children, Jesus said it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now the atheist argument is a straw man fallacy because he ignored what Christianity actually teaches. Instead, he conjured up a distorted and misrepresented version of Christianity and then he attacked his distorted version rather than addressing what Christianity actually teaches. And finally, the atheist argument is a fallacy of composition because he drew a conclusion about the whole of Christianity based on a part. But what makes his fallacious argument even more embarrassing is that the atheist made his conclusion of the whole based on a distorted part that doesn't accurately represent what the Bible says or teaches at all. So all in all, the three fallacious arguments make this atheist seem like he's the epitome of ignorance. Next, the atheist claims that Christianity causes harm because Christianity denies science. You're a science denier. Ah. Again, making himself the epitome of ignorance, he attacks a distorted version of Christianity that is a misrepresentation of the truth. In reality, not only have renowned scientists of the past considered themselves to be, to be believers in God, but many modern scientists also consider themselves to be believers in God. So 
Some examples, Carl Friedrich Gauss, um, Law of Magnetism, Isaac Newton, Laws of Gravitation and Motion, Robert Boyle, Boyle's Law, William Thomson, uh, a.k.a. Lord Kelvin, the Kelvin Scale, Ernest Walton, Artificially Split the Atom, Francis Collins, Human Genome Project, Michael Behe, Irreducible Complexity. Moreover, science confirms creation from a creator via intelligent design and the anthropic principle which showcases intelligent design due to fine-tuning of the universe. Therefore, science and religion are actually in alliance with each other. Science is the how and God is the why. God created and then science reveals how he did it and how he sustains it. If anything, atheists are the science deniers because they reject the obvious conclusion that science points to. Creation comes from a creator. <laughs> Dr. Antony Flew was a leading spokesperson for atheism and was active in many debates. However, scientific discoveries brought him to a conclusion he could not avoid. At New York University, Flew changed his position and now believes in God as the creator of the universe. It is all in my view, a matter of the enormous uh, complexity by which the results were achieved, which looked to me like the work of intelligence. Uh, what, what I think that the DNA material has done has shown by its almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which uh, lead to produce uh, this being, uh, that uh, intelligence must have been involved in uh, getting these extraordinarily diverse elements of, um, uh, to work together. In fact, Dr. Anthony Flew became a believer in a God and he published a book about his conversion. There is a God, how the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. Next, the atheist claims that Christianity causes harm because they strip bodily autonomy away from women. Hmm, okay, what is bodily autonomy? It is the self-governing of one's own body. Thus, your entire argument is already self-defeating. Let me explain why. Essentially, this is the argument of my body, my choice. It becomes the privacy argument. All people have an absolute right to privacy concerning what they do with their bodies. You can't tell me what to do with my body. Okay, essentially this argument proclaims that free will exists and that a person should have the absolute right to choose to keep secret the consequence of a choice made by an action of free will. However, it is the absoluteness of that declared right that should be put into question. If a person's choice creates a consequence that negatively affects someone or others, does that person have the right to keep the negative consequence a secret? even if that secret is murder? Now, the main problem with the bodily autonomy argument is that it completely ignores the fact that the baby in the abortion argument is not the body of the mother, and the mother's body is not the body of the baby. Thus, by arguing for bodily autonomy, the person's argument becomes self-defeating because she is now agreeing that the baby's body is not her body to harm and terminate. <clears throat> and bodily, if bodily autonomy is your argument, then you actually contradict yourself because you reveal that you don't care about another person's body, you only care about your own body. And so you're not truly consistently arguing in favor of bodily autonomy. Rather, you're arguing that your body is more important than another person's body. And by doing so, you're only revealing your narcissistic inflated sense of self-importance and perhaps revealing that you are a sociopath and that you have no empathy or remorse for murdering the life of another human being, especially a human being who is weak innocent and defenseless. And despite your argument that bodily autonomy is not for abortion, your actions say otherwise. 
by considering your life more important than the life of the baby that you murder, your argument is for abortion. In fact, the only reason you're arguing for bodily autonomy is so that you can abort or murder a baby and attempt to justify your sin of murder. But, as we now know, an argument for bodily autonomy calls attention to the baby's body, which is not your body. And if you murder the baby, you don't actually care about bodily autonomy. You show that you only care about seeking your own comfort, convenience, and happiness at the expense of another person's body. That's evil. However, if you're going to advocate for one person's rights to cross over into the rights of another, well, it's crucial to give an equally weighted voice to both parties involved, right? But can we know what the baby within the womb thinks about abortion? Yes, actually we can. Fetal research, research on the fetal pain, makes it evident that the baby in the womb, as early as 20 weeks, possibly even earlier, can feel pain. There are also many documented occurrences of babies within wombs physically responding to intrusions in the womb. The baby's body language makes it evident that his or her response is essentially, Ow! No! Stop hurting my body! But the woman, ignoring the evidence, argues for her bodily autonomy while disregarding the value of the baby's body. Now, I think that anyone who desires to use this horrible argument of bodily autonomy should have to listen to all the people who were survivors from failed abortions and allow the survivors to share details of their bodily autonomy. Now, perhaps you would actually listen and honestly examine the evidence which shows that abortion is objectively and abhorrently wrong. And your fallacious argument for bodily autonomy is directly correlated with the fallacious argument that a fetus is not a human being or a child. However, by arguing this, you make two distinct arguments. One, a baby developing is not yet a human life. And two, termination of the developing human is a good thing. Well, the non-personhood argument states that the thing in the woman's womb is not yet a person. Many argue that it is it's just a human organism, you know, a biological concept, but not a human person's psychological philosophical concept. But the problem with this is that no person of integrity within the scientific community debates that the human organism comes into existence at the moment of conception. So stop being a science denier. Yeah, it's actually you being a science denier. However, many pro-abortion advocates claim that it is just, it's a merely a, a lump of mass or tissue. It's not yet a human person because, you know, the duty to do no harm refers only to persons. No one can have an abortion without any violation against a human person. Is that true? No, absolutely not. No. Again, this is why it is of utmost importance to define our terms. The very definition of abortion admits to both life and murder of said life. To abort means to fail, to cease, or to stop at an early or premature stage, to terminate a procedure prematurely. Something cannot be stopped unless it has already begun. Well, what exactly began? Hmm, it's the process of life. And if the process of a human life has already begun, well, then it is the natural course for the process to continue. Therefore, we need to allow it to continue. Now, some pseudo-scientific studies claim that the life inside of a pregnant woman is not actually a person until a certain amount of time has passed and the fetus has had enough growth to be considered a person. However, not only is this logically absurd, but it's hypocritical. If scientists declare bacteria to be life, then an embryo or a fetus must also be proclaimed as such, as life. Instead, a person must be defined by the essentialistic definition. Now, according to this definition, a person is a living being who has the essential capacity for rational reflection, emotional expression, willful direction, and moral deliberation concerning him or herself and the world around him or her. 
Now, essential capacity means a capability that exists by nature of the kind of being the person is, whether or not such a capacity is ever actualized. All human organisms have this basic inherent capacity for personhood by nature of being human. This essential capacity for personhood comes into existence at the moment of conception. Conception is the key, and this is the reason why women on their menstrual cycles are not immoral. Likewise, it's why an emission of semen by a male in his sleep is not immoral either. A sperm alone will never become a human being. An egg alone from a female will never become a human being. It is in conception that from the sperm and the egg combining that begins the process of human life. And listen, things either exist or they do not. There is no such concept of something becoming into existence. What exists may develop, but there is no such thing as something that partially exists. No, development concerns functioning as a person, not being a person. As we develop, we function better as persons, but that doesn't mean we are more of a person than we were earlier in life. Likewise, when a person is old and deteriorating, that person isn't less of a person than he or she was earlier in life. No, and this is why a handicapped human is not less human than any other human. Likewise, a human with tetraamelia syndrome, born without arms and legs, not any less human than any other human. When a sperm and an egg become one, zygote, conception begins, life also begins. Conception is the origin of personhood as science declares. So stop being a science denier. And if an unborn person, um, if an unborn becomes a person from the moment of conception, well then no one can take his or her life without just cause. And such a cause would have to be one that can apply to any other person regardless of age. And so whenever an ignorant person claims that a fetus is not a child, yeah, well you're correct because a child is a human being in an early stage of life, whereas a fetus is a human being in an earlier stage of life. Still a human being. And by the way, um, did you know that the word fetus is Latin and involves pregnancy, childbirth, and offspring? The depth beyond the surface of this word describes a little one or a young one who is growing in growth, in production. And so your comparison of a fetus to a child would be like saying a boy is not a man and a girl is not a woman. Okay, yeah, sure, but you're still referring to a human being. Your logic is flawed when you claim that a fetus is not a human being because a human is a human being throughout all stages of life regardless of where in time the stage of life exists. And for the ignorant people who claim that termination of the developing human is a good thing, you would need to prove why murdering a weak innocent and defenseless human being is a good thing. Further, you'd have to provide the absolute standard of good in order to explain why murdering that baby is good. How do you know it's good? But it's not, it's not good. It's not, and every sane rational person knows that murder is wrong, especially if the person being murdered is a weak, innocent, and defenseless person, and that's exactly what abortion is. It's murdering a weak, innocent, and defenseless human being. Again, to abort is to terminate the process prematurely. Taking the life of an innocent person to save your own life is not only murder, which is objectively wrong, but it's also cowardly and selfish. In contrast, John 15, 12 to 13 states that sacrificing yourself for the love of another is not only commendable, but there is no greater love than that. And then finally, the atheist claims that Christians force their beliefs on others. However, a simple online search reveals who is actually forcing beliefs on others. And guess what? The guilty party is the godless community. God is
is love. To learn. For example, did you know that Jesus didn't really die on the cross? Oh, sweet Jesus, please let me live. Oh, my God, I got to fix this thing. Please, God in heaven. Please, God, oh, Lord, hear my prayers. Yes! F you, God. Not today, bitch. Please, God, if there's a help, please be merciful to me. Yes, I did it. There is no God in your face. One dot, mother yeah! You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked? Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. We're coming for your children. And now, New Jersey, Illinois, Colorado, California, Washington, and the District of Columbia have ordered that schools teach sexual orientation and gender in numerous classes. I think it's important to hear what is being taught in first grade classrooms now, all in the name of the sexual revolution. Hey, how come my penis gets big sometimes and points up in the air? That's called an erection. Sometimes I touch my penis because it feels good. Sometimes when I'm in my bath or when mom puts me to bed, I like to touch my vulva too. My name is Blackberry. I am a bearded drag queen. That means I'm a lady with lots of facial hair. Do you want to touch my hair? Yep. This program is geared towards kids 10 years old and younger. Turned out to be a registered child sex offender. No one had looked into his real name. Cartoon Network is openly pushing this agenda. They prefer they them pronouns. This family has two daddies. They love each other so proudly. I'm not Ralph anymore. I'm Rachel. Please call me Natalie now. I wanted you guys to hear it from me that I'm transgender. I use she, her pronouns. So in conclusion, necessarily, if moral values exist, then God exists. Necessarily, moral values do exist. Therefore, necessarily, God exists. In other words, if God does not exist, Morality would most certainly be relative. Therefore, the atheist's relativistic claim that Christianity causes harm would be absolutely irrelevant because the harm wouldn't actually be bad or wrong. The atheist would merely not prefer it. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist, but objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Again, the atheist argument for Christians causing harm appeals to that which is bad or wrong. And by appealing to bad, wrong, he appeals to the absolute moral standard of good, right. Therefore, if he cannot provide the standard of good, right, by which all bad, wrong can be known, then how can he claim that Christianity causes harm, which is bad, wrong? No, the truth is that this atheist stole from God from God's absolute moral standard while attempting to justify his own wrong. So in conclusion, it is quite evident that atheism causes harm in the world, not Christianity. Atheism causes harm because they exclude themselves from right living and then even mislead others into also being excluded from right living. The godless are more likely to participate in sexual immorality, produce unwanted pregnancies, have abortions, become deadbeat dads, get divorced and tear families apart, commit suicide, commit crime, deny science, and then attempt to force their beliefs on everyone else in an attempt to justify their evil choices, even though their beliefs are the cause for most evil in this world. So, does Christianity cause harm? No but atheism certainly does. So congratulations, atheist. Not only are you illogical and inconsistent within your own worldview, but you're also intellectually dishonest and causing harm in the world. But there's good news. Yes, throughout all of this horribleness, there is still good news for you. God loves you enough to allow you to repent and come to him so you can start living the right way. In Ezekiel 18, 21 to 23, God says, 
But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him. Because of his righteousness which he has practiced, he will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? And God concludes in verse 32 by saying, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. Now, if you need to better understand exactly what repentance means, please see my article that I published on the matter about repentance. It goes into great detail so you can explain it of what Christianity actually teaches so you don't continue to bring up this distorted version of Christianity. Listen, I pray you do repent. And I know I just gave you a, a tongue lashing in this video, but believe it or not, I would actually love to see you on the new earth under the new heavens because that would mean that you did truly repent. I hope to see you there.